Hi, good afternoon, and welcome to CIO Leadership Live. I'm your host for this episode, Mary Fran Johnson, and I'm here today talking with CIO Jason Nairn, who is with Concordia University out in Portland, Oregon. Jason served as an adjunct professor before joining the Concordia faculty full-time in 2014 as an assistant professor of Homeland Security. He also directed Concordia's Homeland Security Simulation Lab. In 2015, he was promoted into the CIO role, and he still teaches a course each semester on a variety of topics such as the legal and ethical rights around homeland security or risk management. Before moving to Oregon, he was the Director of Infrastructure Protection for the state of Michigan, where Jason led operational security and emergency management for state government buildings and systems. He is a rarity among CIOs. He is a CISIP, a Certified Information Systems Security Professional. He also has a graduate degree in security studies from the Naval Postgraduate School Center for Homeland Defense and Security. Jason is an unusual CIO, not only because of that extensive cybersecurity background and all those certifications, but he's also dealing with a very unusual situation it, at his current place of employment, Concordia University. On February 10th, Concordia announced that it was closing at the end of spring term in April, leaving about 5,000 students in shock and having to lay off 1,500 employees. It is the third private college to close down in Portland in the last two years, which is indicative of the trials and tribulations of private universities in today's financial climate, which is something Jason and I are going to talk about. And if you are, we want to welcome our viewers on LinkedIn and YouTube and Twitter. Please send us, send me and Jason questions while the show is going on, and we would be happy to uh, answer them if we can. Jason. Thanks so much for joining us today in the middle of all the uproar you have going on. How are things going for you and your staff in this first two weeks? It's my pleasure to be here. Thanks so much for inviting me. And, uh, and yeah, the staff is doing well. Last week was difficult. Uh, mm -hmm. We got an announcement early in the week, and uh, it caught a lot of us off guard. But, uh, you know, people uh, have kind of processed some of that. And uh, my team is, is doing what they always do, and that is uh, taking care of business. Mm -hmm. And that's a team of about, you're supporting those 5,000 students on premise and online. There's about 30 of you in the IT services division. That's correct. And we have a, a couple of campuses in Portland, as well as a law school in Boise. And those 30 people uh, mm -hmm. support all those facilities. Yeah. yeah. So that's... Um, that's that's a lot to that's a lot to handle and to manage, because um, we talked a little bit about the the talent challenges of keeping IT uh, uh, skilled IT people around, and your challenges just went up by about a factor of ten, didn't they? <laughs> sure did. Yeah, we've we've had a few folks leave us, and and you know we're glad to help them uh, move on to to uh, new opportunities, uh, and we've always been. That way, you know, there's a fair amount of turnover uh, in IT, and Portland is actually doing really well in the IT uh, sector. Mm -hmm. A lot of great opportunities in Portland, so folks are moving on, and uh, and some folks, thankfully, are staying Good. and uh, <laughs> help. Uh, you know, we still have students, and we'll have students till midsummer, and we want to make sure that they have a seamless experience. Okay. Well, and we'll we'll get we'll talk about that because I know that that's in the last four or five years. That's what you've spent a lot of. <clears throat> your IT expertise on. But let's talk first about what is involved in closing down a university. What happens to all the academic and the physical assets? Well, I'm about to find out. <laughs> <laughs> this is true. <laughs> but I can tell you that, uh, you know, I've spoken to some colleagues who unfortunately have, have gone through the same thing. Portland, uh, Concordia is the third university in town here. Yeah. To close in the last two years. And we've had uh, so we've unfortunately had some local uh, and regional experience in the in mm -hmm. that matter. I had the great pleasure of having lunch with a colleague last week who was extremely helpful. And what happens is uh, you work with uh, friends. You know, mm -hmm. honestly, uh, there are folks that step up and help in these the, situations. The network, Others, the network comes to yeah, the rescue, other, doesn't it? Uh, mm -hmm. uh, you know, there will be a. Um, a number of different partners that we that we rely on to help carry forward our data and uh, and manage our financial assets and our uh, and our physical assets going forward. So 
there's a, a great deal of people that are kind of rallying around us right now as we as we work to uh, to go through the process. Our number one goal being supporting students uh, and then supporting our faculty and staff as as we uh, transition. Mm -hmm. And, uh, and uh, we're thankful for all the uh, great help that we're receiving. Have you seen any, is there a dramatic uptick in help desk, desk requests or anything from that population you're serving? Because you've got a pretty good relationship going with everyone now. It sounds like you've yeah. spent a lot of time making sure it's, it's a, IT is viewed in a very beneficent fashion at Concordia. Yes, track our, our um, you know, our satisfaction uh, in, the, in response to issues, and, and we, we regularly are over 98% in uh, customer satisfaction. So we do get a lot of calls in the tech center. And frankly, you know, uh, I got two questions coming in uh, more than any others. And one is what's going to happen to my email address. Oh, and okay. the other Fair one enough. is my laptop. Those are the two big questions that yep. uh, the people on staff wants to know if they can keep their hardware and mm -hmm. uh, employees want to know how long their network account and their, um, uh, email address is going to be good for. And those are good questions. They're, mm -hmm. they're a little bit up in the air as yet, but um, okay. I think that uh, we think that we're, we're going we're to have clarity on those very, very soon. Yeah. Well, when something like this happens to any kind of organization, there are always big initiatives going on in the IT department that have to kind of come to a sudden stop. <laughs> so um, talk about that. I know you had a very, you've had a very large cloud initiative in motion and you've gotten, you've essentially adopted a very cloud first profile for any sort of new software and services. So where, uh, give us an idea about where things had gotten to and what now comes to a stop. Well, you know, interestingly, we did, uh, uh, cloud first was one of our principles that, uh, that I put mm -hmm. in place when I took the job in 2015. And that was because we recognized one, one of the characteristics of Concordia is that we're uh, geographically sort of landlocked. We don't have a lot of extra space and we're in a neighborhood, so mm -hmm. we can't expand out to the in any direction really. So uh, finding ways to save space and to efficiently use space was, was kind of part of the ethos here. Mm -hmm. And that's one of the reasons why we got into online education so early. And that's one of the reasons why we got into the cloud so early is because we wanted to make sure that we were using what we had on ground uh, as, mo as efficiently as possible. Now that we're heading into a closure situation, actually being cloud first is helping us there too, because our data is secured, it's backed up, it's in uh, remote locations where we can access it when we need to. And when we do find out who um, who's gonna be the custodial recipient of that data going forward, mm -hmm. we're gonna be able to sort of give them the keys to the kingdom and and uh, and ho hopefully have it uh, be a pretty convenient transfer. Yeah. As opposed to saying, we've gotta, we've gotta bring down a data center transfer hardware or transfer software or transfer data and then bring it up somewhere else uh, with the cloud, it's a little bit easier to transition. So yeah. we're, we're pretty happy with yeah. it. Had you, had you managed, had you gotten to a point where pretty much all of the essential data was in the cloud? Were you that far along? No, not quite. Uh, a, a great deal of it was, and mm -hmm. and certainly a lot of it was backed up in the cloud. So mm -hmm. we had uh, we have some uh, systems on premise. We still have, a, for instance, network storage, which you know, um, uh, a lot of uh, a lot of institutions now can just uh, kind of direct their employees to use the OneDrive or or another um, you know another uh, cloud based uh, storage solution. We still had a, a on-premise storage uh, solution there, and we were migrating folks. We we uh, migrated personal drives first, and then we were looking to do some more institutional drives uh, into the cloud, and uh, and so we were in the process and sort of had a hybrid in, in that area. But we were virtualized, heavily virtualized, uh, and and uh, we had a lot of cloud solutions that were working well for us. So. Mm -hmm. All those partners now are, are coming to the table, and, and several of them have been extremely helpful. Yes. Uh, uh, with, with, you know, sort of a, a plan for, for transitioning. Okay, excellent. Well, we already have our first question from one of our favorite regular viewers, CIO Richard Cope. Uh, he He's sorry to hear the news on your closing, uh, which is a, definitely a sentiment we share, but wants to know what challenges do you have in educational higher ed IT that you might not find in other areas of business? Great question, Richard. Thanks mm -hmm. for joining us today. 
and uh, you know the the higher ed space is highly regulated, and, and a lot of people don't realize just how highly regulated it is. There's a there's a fair amount of compliance based um, um, issues that you know not every business now every business has compliance issues and, and regulation, but uh, but you know when it comes to financial aid, when it comes to uh, FERPA regulations, when it comes to even things like GDPR. And the and some of the newer laws that are coming out, uh, GLBA applies, uh, HIPAA mm -hmm. applies. There's an extreme amount of compliance-related uh, um, data issues associated with higher ed that probably a lot of people don't think about. And uh, and all of those we have to pay attention to both in the operation of the business normally as well as in the closure process because we have to protect that data, especially student data, from uh, unlawful disclosure. And uh, we've had a few incidents over the years, and and there's uh, um, there's a lot of um, there's a lot of work that goes into making sure that we can not only um, handle a pre-crisis situation with uh, with all those compliance issues and data, but also that we can respond to any issues that arise. And yeah. uh, and you know, it's surprisingly the folks in the IT business here are surprisingly uh, knowledgeable, mm -hmm. and you're find that they're going to they're going to be able to apply that knowledge in a number of different sectors outside of education because education has a lot of these uh, characteristics. Yes. Well, yes, and I, you know that's uh, when you said you were a highly regulated industry, I think of that as like gas and oil companies. You don't immediately right. think that higher ed is going to be that, right. but I suppose it's it's almost the equivalent of being a healthcare organization. You've got all awesome. kinds of private information. Absolutely. Is. And yeah. it took me years, honestly, years to understand financial aid regulation. <laughs> that 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 alone is, and, and the reporting yeah. requirements. You know, I, I, I've not been personally involved in an industry that has the rigid reporting requirements that uh, that education does. That's interesting because you come out of a very security and homeland security kind of background. So yeah. I would have I would have thought this would be a piece of cake. Yeah, well, you, you know, I, I might have thought that too when I took the job. <laughs> but I found out otherwise. It was, uh, it was, uh, it, it, and, and frankly, one of the reasons I was hired was because I had that security background, and the leadership, to their credit, recognized that we needed to take some steps in that regard mm -hmm. to move all forward for the institution and reduce risk. And one of the first things I did, uh, one of the first meetings I had, was with the uh, the board of regents uh, risk management subcommittee. Because they wanted to know, they said, we've been waiting to see some action on this. We want to know what you're doing. Oh, and so interesting. right into the fire. Yeah. Well, and that's great because actually our next um, question from our online audience was asking about how you approach security and cybersecurity. And I know we're going to talk about that quite a bit. Um, yeah. In fact, one of my first questions for you when we got on the phone last week, you know, I had looked at your background and I said, so much security. What are you doing, the CIO of a higher ed institution? But they kind of they recruited you right out of the classroom, didn't they? Yes. Yes. And, uh, you know, it kind of started out, uh, they said, hey, uh, uh, you know, we have a question. And, and they came with a question. <clears throat> and then they said, hey, uh, we're going to hire a CIO. Would you look over this position description and see if it has everything that uh, that you think it should have in a CIO? And okay. then I gave them some comments. And then they said, hey, uh, can you just do that, uh, you know, job so <laughs> Uh, kind of an evolution, but uh, but yeah, and right in right into it, uh, yeah. the security is helpful. You so, know, having that. So it was kind of. Can you just add that to your teaching load? <laughs> you know, being well, the CIO. Exactly what they did, yeah, they, yeah. They, they they turned some of my teaching credits into CIO credits. Yeah. Okay, excellent, excellent. Well, let's before we get much more in depth on the cybersecurity stuff, because I know we have a lot to say on that. Yeah. Let's do that. I like, always like to go up to that 30,000 foot view and look at the disruption going on in your industry. And we talked about higher ed and you mentioned the largest change happening in higher ed is actually the number of students that are what engaged with it. Yeah, there are extreme forces at work in the in the higher ed market right now. It's one of these uh, industries that really having a transition around uh, the just the way the world is now mm -hmm. and uh, and one of those is that the birth rate uh, is uh, has declined somewhat uh, mm -hmm. since you know the baby boomers went to school mm -hmm. and uh, Gen X and Millennials just don't aren't having children at the same rate so there's fewer students to to uh, to compete for yeah. and then there's you know an online landscape where a student can basically go anywhere they want you know to take mm -hmm. courses uh, 
and they're willing to uh, to maybe try one thing and then move to a different thing uh, before they find kind of their, uh, what they're happy with. And so uh, all of these pressures are, are really taking the traditional educational model and making it a little obsolete. And so the question becomes, you know, mm -hmm. if you're not a heavily funded, uh, well-endowed university, uh, then how are you going to compete in that landscape? And yeah. private universities, especially small privates that are tuition based are, are really struggling to kind of figure out the magic, uh, the magic formula. Yeah. Uh, and, it's... Uh, and some are doing that well, and, and there are some that are doing that well, and some are, and some are not. And, uh, and, and I think it's uh, really interesting to watch the business right now. Mm -hmm. It's, it's change. Yes. Well, you said that, too, that having a, a fairly robust economy over the last year or two has also been a problem for universities. Yeah. And that surprised me. I guess I wasn't thinking in terms of that. Why is that a problem? Well, because uh, people aren't going back to school. They're, they're in the workforce. I saw an article last week that said something like uh, uh, there was a record number of people who were happy with their personal lives. It's, it's mm -hmm. uh, the survey that was done was never over 90 percent before. And now it's over 90 percent of people are happy uh, with their with their personal lives, and that's more that's because they have a good job that pays well. In a lot of cases, not every case, but uh, there's folks out there who are in the professional world who are doing the things that they want to do and making money at it. And mm -hmm. uh, so those folks aren't that interested in going back for a master's or a right. or a doctoral degree because the, mm -hmm. the the economic landscape allows them to be successful with what they have. And I yeah. think that's great uh, in a lot of ways, but for universities, it's tough to find those people that do want to go back and then recruit them to your uh, facility. Right, you know? right. Well, I know you're also, you're in process working on your doctoral degree. Yeah, I'm just about, well, I'm just about finished. I, I defend on March Excellent. 12th, so I'll be- <gasps> Terrific. Uh, be a doctor in a few weeks, if, if all goes well. And you'll be a doctor of what? Uh, I have a doctor of education. Okay. And the higher ed administration. Oh, excellent. Are you going to make all your friends address you as Dr. Dr. Jason yeah, from now children, on? <laughs> children especially. Dr. Dad. <laughs> Dr. Dad. <laughs> the, um, let me see. One of the things that you mentioned, and I thought it might be interesting to talk about, especially because we're getting questions on security, um, but back to 2014 when you were a faculty member, you were essentially running the world's largest homeland security simulator. Uh, right. Tell us a little bit about that, and what will happen to that uh, that section or that technology now? Do you know yet? Yeah, well, I know. I know what's happened to it, and it's it's in uh, uh, a room next door here. <laughs> yeah. We should um, we should have set up in there. You could have given us a tour. <laughs> but the uh, the the simulator was a was a was a way to help. You know, and this is the beauty of the Homeland Security Enterprise is that it's really a, it's really a leadership degree. Mm -hmm. And 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 what we do is we take our students who are every everything from uh, military veterans to uh, traditional freshmen, and we teach them uh, critical thinking and ethical decision making. That's really what the degree is all about. And what the simulator does is it allows us to take a, a student that has never been in a leadership role before, and put them into a situation where they can make leadership decisions. You know, they don't when you join the fire department, you don't get to be chief. Uh, uh, overnight, you've got to do all the different positions, and that's similar in emergency management. You know, you don't get to be incident commander mm -hmm. without doing various positions. And um, what we were able to do with the simulator is tell students, okay, you're the chief now, and here's your scene. Uh, and the the simulator had a 26 foot parabolic screen, and they would actually physically stand in the center of it and direct a response to whatever mm -hmm. crisis uh, um, was the crisis of the day yeah. in the simulation lab. And so uh, it allowed us to put students in a situation that they wouldn't normally be able to be in for a very long time and give them a, a feeling for how their decisions that they make affect uh, the landscape in front of them. Mm -hmm. And it was, a, and it was and is a, uh, a great tool. And now uh, when we built it, virtual reality wasn't as prevalent with the goggles and so forth. Right. And now you can do a lot with the, with the, uh, with the head, you know, the headgear and, and mm -hmm. uh, um, the, the virtual reality setup. So we, we do have some of that as well. Going. Great, great. Um, 
The One of the questions that I wanted to get to also was about, we've mentioned risk management a few times and all of your cybersecurity background. Uh, t- talk a little bit about the difference between cybersecurity and risk management. Where do they intersect? How do you how do you explain them to people when you know regular people out in the world ask you about that? Yeah, and I actually get asked a lot about that from students. There's a lot of interest in risk management, sort of as a profession right now, and I think there's some opportunity there for folks that are interested in that in that regard. Um, I believe that risk management is one of five or six essential principle or essential uh, uh, competencies of good leadership. So if you have uh, if you have risk management ability, if you have crisis management ability, time management, money management, and relationship management, I think those are key um, management skills that every C-suite leader should have. Risk management goes beyond IT security. It goes beyond the 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 uh, the cybersecurity and and really encompasses everything that a business, uh, all the business units of an institution. So the CFO needs to be able to mitigate risk in the area of finances and Mm -hmm. IT leaders need to be able to mitigate risk in the IT sector. But also the CEO needs to know how they're mitigating risk across the organization and the board needs to make sure that the the leadership is considering all the different risks that are happening. Mm-hmm. And uh, when you don't manage risk well, you know, you you can get surprised and I don't I don't mm-hmm. I don't think that many people like being surprised in business and uh, <laughs> true enough. I think that it's uh, I think that it's uh, the whole reason why we have business intelligence, right? Is mm-hmm. is because we want to gather data and analyze it so that we can uh, produce something that helps leaders make informed decisions. Yeah. And so uh, with that, with that risk management over, and now there's folks out there who are chief risk management officers mm-hmm. and, and I don't think that's anything new, but, but I think there's more focus on it now. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, if you are just joining us, either on LinkedIn or YouTube or, or uh, watching on Twitter, I'm here with Jason Nairn, who is the CIO of Concordia University in Portland, which announced just 10 days ago that they have to close down. So we're having a big conversation about the security and the leadership aspects around that. And uh, welcome to the program, and we'll get we'll get back into it. We're getting some great questions from the audience, and we encourage you to keep sending them. And let me, uh, one of the questions we got, and I think we've pretty much answered it about the primary cause of private universities closing. It's the shrinking student population. It's usually financial reasons. Yeah, you know, I think there's a lot of causes. You know, I don't think that it, it would be easier for us on this end of things to mm-hmm. be able to point to something and say, well, there's, there's there what is. we can yeah. differently, right? Or, or that's what's causing it. And it's not the case. You know, we had great partnerships, we had great uh, collaboration, we had uh, lots of great programs. But in the end, you know, the there are a number of forces that are acting on uh, the private uh, university right now, yeah. that are very difficult to overcome. Mm-hmm. And I think uh, as time goes on, and, and we get into the weeks and months ahead, I think there'll be more maybe more clarity on yeah. uh, what our particular um, causes were, but I think that uh, right now it's it's a host of factors. Mm-hmm. Well, and continuing a little bit along that risk management theme that we were developing, how do you think that risk management overall reflects in the CIO's position today? And are do you see gaps? Do you see places where, uh, from talking to fellow CIOs in other industries, you recognize that maybe certain areas of risk management are not getting enough attention? Yeah, absolutely. And, mm-hmm. and a lot of it has to do with resources. You know, there's only okay. so much uh, so much you can do. One of the things we teach in our risk management class, uh, uh, which is called risk assessment and analysis, is um, where to apply resources most effectively in order to gain the greatest return on your investment. Mm-hmm. So we look at a systems approach and we say across uh, whatever system you're trying to mitigate risk in, um, where are the points in which you can actually uh, apply resources and then have it affect the entire system in a beneficial way? And that's kind of one of the basic tools that you use because you can't mitigate risk across the entire um, uh, uh, profile. And the, the CIO can't do that either. Mm-hmm. So CIO has to sort of weigh, um, well, you know, I have risk in the area of 
GDPR. Uh, that's one example that that CIOs considered in the past couple of years. Mm -hmm. um, if I if I think about my exposure in the GDPR landscape, you know, it's a it's a European law, um, but I do have customers in Europe or I do have a presence in Europe. Uh, what are the things that I need to do to uh, address that risk versus I have exposure in uh, American uh, legislation as well, uh, whether it's GLBA or HIPAA or PCI compliance, payment card industry standards. Um, those issues all come to bear on the CIO at once, and mm -hmm. you kind of have to prioritize because you really can't do it. We took a big project and uh, and worked with a partner to, to do a GLBA, HIPAA, and um, PCI compliance assessments and mm -hmm. audits uh, all at once, really one right after the other, um, to try to get to a point where we were comfortable with domestic uh, uh, compliance before we really attacked the, the GDPR issue. Okay. So we prepared ourselves so that when GDPR came, we were, we were ready to, to move on to that one. But we had our ducks in a row back in the, mm -hmm. in, you know, in the domestic law. Well, and I think <clears throat> you mentioned to me that you're, uh, that you, you're planning to give a talk soon uh, and the title of it is "We Climb the Compliance Mountain." <laughs> That's right. Yeah, it's gonna it's gonna be about that project, about looking at the uh, PCI, GLBA, and HIPAA as uh, as key issues for IT professionals, and, and then um, where you go from there as far as addressing things like GDPR or CCPA, the new California privacy law that is now affecting a lot of for profit. Uh, right. And right. The um. <clears throat> One of the things you mentioned, um, and I was fascinated with them, were the, the your 12 principles uh, mm -hmm. that you developed on how to run IT. This is something you developed as you got into the CIO job. This is yes, not, and, yeah. And, and to be honest, you know, I looked at other principles uh, mm -hmm. from other institutions. There's a yeah. lot of institutions that develop sort of a, a principled approach to IT, and I thought it was a great, uh, and I had a colleague who shared theirs, and so I borrowed from a, a lot of different places. It's mm -hmm. certainly not something that I invented, but it is something that I'm proud of because we followed them. Ah. So as, uh, and the way that it helps, especially the employees is uh, when my, uh, I have probably the greatest uh, principal engineer in the business. He's, he's awesome. Mm -hmm. And uh, when he would make a decision about where to put servers, he knew our principal was cloud first. He knew that that's what I was yeah. interested in promoting. Right. And so he would, you know, it, he didn't waste time looking at data center uh, adding racks or, mm -hmm. you know, uh, or getting hardware in our data center. He knew that cloud was where he needed to look. And so that those kind of principles help guide the ship a little bit. And it helps the crew understand these are the things that when we make these decisions that come to bear on the decision making process. And it sort of makes it a little more efficient as far as the. Uh, um, you know, making recommendations to me and, and my recommendations to leadership, if everybody, including my bosses, know that's our principle. Right, right. Well, and I, I thought that was um, that was a, a really that was a really good one. And it sounded like one that a lot of CIOs are probably following now. Um, among your 12 principles were things promoting open standards, establishing service level standards, addressing compliance systems yeah. and solutions that are agile and nimble and flexible. Um, how, do you, how do you judge that, agile, nimble, and flexible? <laughs> yeah, that's hard, isn't it? Yeah, I knew you were going to ask me. That's, uh, <laughs> that's on there for, for a particular reason, and that yeah. is because you know, sometimes folks feel like IT is, is, a, is a barrier you know, to change mm -hmm. and adaptation. And, and we wanted to come out with a principle that said we are not here to, uh, to create barriers. We're here to enable the business units. We understand that the business is moving mm -hmm. at an extremely high speed all the time. And we don't want to be the, the no IT group. We want to be the, uh, maybe we got to do it a little differently, you know, but not the no. <laughs> and uh, so we wanted to come out and we wanted to establish, uh, you know, expectations early that we were there to help you make changes. If changes were what was best for the business. Yeah. And um, and that's really where that principle comes from is to try to avoid that. And, you know, mm -hmm. it's uh, it's something that I try to engender in the employees, too. And they the yeah. folks here have been great about that. You know, the guy sitting outside the door right now making sure the noise is, is down <laughs> is uh, one of those guys. He's just out there uh, helping people to meet their goals. And yeah. that's what IT is all about. 
that's well that's I really I really like that philosophy <clears throat> and I think it, because you didn't want to be the department of no you wanted to be the department of let's talk about that a little yeah. further so, <laughs> or at the very least no but you know yeah <laughs> or no and here's yeah. the solution to it um well among them uh, while we're still kind of in that area about talking about risk management one of the questions from our audience was, what should be on the checklist of risk management for a CIO? What are the Ooh. couple top few items you would imagine being on there? I know the audience comes up with better questions than I do. <laughs> yeah, they do. And that's a that's a good one. That's, yeah. that's, that's a long checklist, you know. Yes. Uh, right now, I can give you a snapshot of right now what sort of keeps me up at night. And okay. that is, uh, you know, uh, when we came out with this announcement last Monday, Mm -hmm. uh, we had a meeting and uh, one of the first things I said was, folks, uh, you know, we're going to be a, a potential target. You know, we're going to have an announcement out there in the media. And, yep. uh, you know, there are bad actors out there that are, you know, kind of uh, interested in trying to exploit that. Oh. So, you know, we had to do some messaging around, um, you know, trying to get folks to understand that if you see an email that asks you to do something or, mm -hmm. you know, it, it, it seems like double check and make sure that those things are, you um, our, uh, our, our legitimate requests, because there are folks out there that will take advantage of not just this situation, but any situation, including, you know, the holidays yep. or yep. Uh, anything like that to, to try to get a leg up or, or, a, or a tentacle into the network and, and cause a disruption. Yeah. Another thing is, you know, the propagation of ransomware right now at large in the, in the world is, is a concern. Mm -hmm. And the ransomware is getting more and more uh, virile. I think it's uh, it's reaching deeper into organizations. It's causing more disruption. And I think CIOs need to be aware of, of that. And then uh, this idea, not security based, but this idea of being uh, the CIO that that works towards change and, and understands the velocity at which business moves now. Mm -hmm. That is a issue if uh, if you're not managing change then you're not managing risk that's a well <clears throat> we're probably going to have to put that on a placard too that's actually a pretty good that's a pretty good <laughs> saying <laughs> <clears throat> we had a one question that we had was also kind of specific. It was about whether you're using project management methodologies at, to shut down various app and business processes as you go through the closure. Yeah. Is, is this just essentially another thing to project manage? It is. Actually, mm -hmm. it is. And we have a we have we started up a OneNote uh, that uh, we use for mm -hmm. all of our collaboration. So we're uh, we're a Microsoft customer. We have uh, Teams, which is a is a is a cool collaborative tool. And in Teams, you can uh, you can create uh, Teams with OneNote. We have a IT team OneNote right now that is uh, listing all of our contracts and it's listing all of our frequently asked questions. And as mm -hmm. our team uh, works together to answer questions, novel questions that come up, we we put them in there. Mm -hmm. uh, and then we can take that content, we can deliver it to a website, we can deliver it to a customer. Mm -hmm. uh, but we're all collaborating in the same space and creating a method for us to sort of keep each other informed of the things that come up because it's not, you know, uh, and I'm a big fan of project management methodologies and, and we're, we're lean uh, savvy here and agile and, and, and we have a PMP on board the IT shop, but the, um, but this is uh, is not your normal project. This is devolution, right? So yeah. um, while we approach it like a project, we're also learning as we go. And we need to be able to capture that knowledge in sort of a lessons learned database and then uh, and then share that out. And uh, we're using Teams for that right now. It's working very well. Excellent. Well, we had also a couple of questions about, and this has to do more with um, the skill levels and the upskilling on your own IT staff. And the question was whether you recommend that your staff pursue traditional academic routes, like I know you're getting a doctorate, uh, the, the EDD, um, or should they be upskilling with yearly continuing ed programs and certifications just to stay on top of current trends yeah absolutely i'm a big fan of certifications as you mm -hmm. probably figured out i've got a few <laughs> that you didn't mention and, and the reason yeah, is, is because great ways to um to kind of stay on top of the business and again it's about it's about moving with the velocity of the business so mm -hmm. um for instance and, and one of the things that we did with uh that i did with my staff that i really uh and i actually developed this in the state but a lot of people come to you and say i want to get a certification 
And you as a CIO have to decide uh, how much uh, resources you're going to spend on doing that. So what I have my employees do is I have them uh, pay for the initial assessment. They go and get that assessment. We provide the learning materials because those can be used by multiple employees. Mm -hmm. They take the exam and if they pass it, we reimburse the exam. So we have uh, sort of a method to make sure they go to the finish line. Yep. And then uh, we help them by re- reimbursing them when they when they succeed. Mm-hmm. So there's a, a positive reinforcement there. And that's done well. We just had a guy here in the next room uh, finish his CCNA this week. And uh, that is great. Uh, you know, there, you can't beat it. There's there's uh, traditional education will teach you how a computer works. A CCNA will teach you how Cisco works. And you need both. Yeah. Yeah. Well, and, and you mentioned, too, one of your big principles. I think we were talking about um, innovation and uh, Concordia has a chief innovation officer, but mainly someone who works on the education side about innovating in the classroom. It wasn't necessarily to do with technology, right. but yeah, they're, they're great. They're, they're a, you know, an Apple educator and they're, uh, they're big innovators. And, and uh, so we have a collaborative relationship. They come to me with things that they think are innovative ideas and we mm-hmm. and we try them and and uh, pilot things and it's been a it's been a great but as cio you, you can be in that space if you want to but you also have the operational space to manage. yes well and that's why i was a little surprised when you said my real passion around innovation well i'd probably describe myself as a proponent of maintenance I do, yeah. <laughs> Okay, I, I, explain that because that's that sounds a little bit. I guess that sounds a little bit um, uh, pedestrian. You know, like, well, I think we should just maintain everything we have. That doesn't sound innovative. I know it's not, but you know what? <laughs> uh, there are uh, there what there are opportunity bound for being at maintenance. I, I am uh, I am speaking in praise of maintenance, and I'm a maintenance evangelist. I love innovation. You know, and yeah. I'm, always an, uh, an early adopter, maybe not the earliest adopter, but, but an early adopter. But we don't always maintain things well in IT. And, mm-hmm. and this probably is in any kind of, uh, you know, business, but yeah. uh, I'll, I'll speak to my experience. You know, in IT, we, we buy bright, shiny objects sometimes, and we don't use them to their fullest, mm-hmm. right? So there are apps out there that have so much power and potential and uh, folks get them and then they use you know one tenth or one fifth of the capacity or potential of that particular tool yeah and uh, i like to really invest in what we have and that means maintaining it well Mm -hmm. keeping everything patched and updated and and moving forward but also training folks uh, helping them to to get the most out of the tools so that they're uh so that they're maximizing the investment in the institution Mm -hmm. and uh, and so while I love to innovate, I also love to maintain. And, uh, and I think both are really critical. And, you know, if, you, if I had to choose, you know, I might choose maintenance, but we'll, we'll, <laughs> we'll, leave that, we'll leave that for another talk. Well, and when you talk about updating and patching and all that, that's when, you're, that's when your security roots are really showing. Cause yeah, yeah. I'm, I'm known to be professionally skeptical in a lot of areas, but yeah. I will say that, um, uh, you know, I think you need a, a healthy balance and mm-hmm. sometimes in in pursuit of innovation we neglect the things that we already have implemented okay well good i think that that's actually a really good point and it's when you don't hear made a lot so i think it's great that we're talking about it um let me see well our audience keeps wanting us to go back and talk about risk management the uh the latest question is what elements should a cio take into account for efficient risk management and i guess i should start out asking you what would you mean by efficient risk management? Yeah, that's a great question. Yeah. Um, and, uh, and, and I'm not, um, you know, I think that uh, maintenance is a, is, a, is a way to be efficient and to, uh, and to reduce risk and maintain, you know, good, by... Good segue like, there, yes. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I mean, it's something we just talked about, but I think that, you know, there's opportunities there for, uh, for reducing risk when you, when you have a well-maintained system, Mm-hmm. Uh, well-maintained architecture, well-maintained network, well-maintained applications, and uh, and and things are like I said, and I keep um, kind of repeating myself, but things are moving so fast that you have to pay attention to to what's happening because changes are are happening constantly. You know, mm-hmm. uh, old uh, old uh, application uh, features are being retired, new features are being added. And, uh, you know, you can end up having employees using something before you even know it exists. So uh, I think efficient risk management is first good maintenance. 
its second uh, collaboration with the other parts of the organization. Mm -hmm. So you just That's can't work point. in your IT silo, right? Mm -hmm. So when you have a when you when you identify a risk that maybe extends to uh, another business unit, you need to collaborate with them to address that. So that's two right there. Yep, that's and that, that's a pretty good answer. Because uh, that's that's always the thing with questions from our live audience out there that we don't exactly know what's going to come. And right. speaking of you, our audience, if you're just joining us, we're in the final final lap of our conversation here with Jason Nairn, who is the CIO at Concordia University in Portland, which unfortunately is closing down in April. So we've been talking about the de-evolution of an academic environment and all the various things that are involved in that and risk management management and cybersecurity have been coming up a lot. Um, but one of the questions, so back to you, Jason, one of the questions that um, I had asked you about were some of the things that you were very proud of that you and your, your staff had accomplished in the last four or five years. And one of the things you mentioned was about adding metrics and data analysis to the way you do business. Look at yeah. the big smile on your face. You love this yeah. topic. So talk about that a little bit and how that became the norm. How well, did you, what's the before and after picture there? What did you change? Yeah, great. Well, this is, this is yeah, another hot topic, I think, because uh, a lot of institutions and organizations want uh, the kind of information that comes from paying attention to data and analyzing it in a way that helps, again, leaders make good decisions. Mm -hmm. uh, just to give you one example, one of the things that we knew right off the bat was that we needed to improve employee training and awareness around security issues. That was one of the reasons I was hired. And so mm -hmm. we, we took a two-pronged approach. The first thing we did was we, uh, we worked with a, with a partner a friend of mine who I actually was my old boss, a company called Security Mentor has a 12, a sort of a 12 month uh, mm. uh, training program that helps uh, helps you get everybody up to a certain level of understanding with respect to uh, security awareness. Okay. And then uh, we use that in combination with a tool called Know Before, which many of my uh, colleagues out there are going to be familiar with. Know Before has great metrics on who's uh, who's doing well. It allows you to send out uh, um, simulated phishing attacks mm -hmm. and really understand across the landscape. We had uh, we had uh, 10,000 users that were out there with uh, network accounts, and all of those folks had um, some level of uh, interaction with simulated phishes. And we knew we did a quarterly simulated phish, and we knew every quarter who was uh, um, falling for uh, susceptible. Mm -hmm. And we had good metrics around that. Then we had remedial training and we had good metrics around who had completed the remedial training. And I was able to go to my risk management subcommittee of the board and say, here's what we've done. Here's the results. And here's where we're at. And we have a fish prone percentage of 13% mm -hmm. and the industry average is 24%. When you deliver uh, data like that, mm -hmm. everybody in the room loves it. You know, the, <laughs> yes. everybody loves to see those numbers. Mm -hmm. And when you can show them the numbers and then show them and, and then, you know, I'll get the question, well, well, how did my department do? Well, how's my department? Yeah. You no, know, frankly, Bob, your department's not quite as good as, <laughs> as, as, as the department. I and know. so, uh, you know, you, you, in, you uh, ingrain some loyalty and competition among executives. Yes. I mean, it just pays dividends down the road. So yeah. that's one example of how data and metrics and analytics uh, really helps improve. Another one would be in the tech center, you know, letting mm -hmm. us letting the employees see how well they're doing, responding to uh, 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 issues in the tech center. By I put a big TV up on the wall that shows that rotates through all the metrics from our Zendesk instance. Yes, and it's got a little app on it that kind of gathers all the data and, and spits it out. Yep. And they're able to see day to day how they're doing with respect to uh, responding to tickets, what the timing is, what mm -hmm. the satisfaction feedback is. And uh, that helps them to improve. Yeah. So it's those, a, are, those are two examples. It's a, it's another great way to kind of gamify the competitive spirit. That's right. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. Gamification's hot in education right now. So. I'm sure. I think it has been for quite a while. <laughs> in fact, one of our questions, and this this might be above both of our pay grades, um, but one of them wanted to know whether. Will higher education survive in its current form? Do you see it going, just moving mainly to online learning in the future? Is that, what is the feeling among higher ed uh, CIOs and IT leaders? Is that well, inevitably I, I, the direction? I can tell you what the feeling is among students because there's a report oh, okay. that comes out called the ECAR report. Mm -hmm. 
that comes out every year and it polls students on how they feel about online education versus the classroom. And most students, based on the 2019 report that I've recently seen, most students do not want all online. They want some kind of hybrid of maybe online and maybe um, some interaction uh, either in person or maybe with live uh, uh, mm -hmm. synchronous activity. And so, uh, you know, in my courses, I do uh, typically either weekly or every other week, I'll do a, a WebEx or a Zoom mm -hmm. uh, interaction with students. And they and they don't always make it because we, we have a lot of adult degree uh, yeah. folks, but it's optional. But they come through. Uh, it's an all online program, but they come through to that uh, to that live session in, in good numbers. And they always feel like they've gotten something more than just the regular asynchronous online uh, mm -hmm. education experience yeah do i think education is going to survive in its current form not in the private uh mm -hmm. in the landscape i think the big uh, harvards mm -hmm. r1 institutions will continue to uh, be fairly similar they'll do more online but they'll also do their traditional on ground uh, research-based programs okay but, uh, but the but the privates are gonna uh, there's gonna be more and more private institutions that are going to be closing in the coming years for the same reasons that concordia is closing and for probably different reasons yeah. Uh, and uh, it's going to continue to uh, be a pressure mm -hmm. for uh, private Exactly. Institutes. Well, it's it's essentially par a picture of a very shifting landscape. Uh, yeah. And and most industries, when you look at them today, just about everything has gone through some form of digital transformation. And right. transformation is always kind of change with a capital T instead of a C. You know, it's just right. things shut yeah. down, things change, absolutely. Um, yeah. One of the things I thought, too, that was interesting when we were talking about metrics, um, you had a great example of how you can use metrics when others are talking in more nebulous uh, sort of phrases, like one yeah. of your uh, colleagues who called and wanted to, I guess, uh, lower, uh, pay less, lower service, but higher online accessibility. And how could we do that? And right, right. So, uh, yeah, you know, when you're in IT, you often get uh, questions like that, where they're just kind of like broad generalizations. And I work with my <laughs> students all the time, you know, it's like, don't give me broad generalizations. Tell me what you mean. <laughs> And, uh, and and somebody came in and said, you know, uh, what if we provided lower service? Well, mm -hmm. what does lower service look like? You know, how do you? Uh, so I have a metric that says mm -hmm. what the current service level is, and it's ninety eight percent satisfaction. Is lower service seventy percent satisfaction? Are you comfortable, you know, going on record saying that that's acceptable? Mm -hmm. We have to kind of create some measurements around things because we can't. Uh, we can't talk in generalizations and expect folks to understand what it means and how to react to it in a way that helps the business. Mm -hmm. So sometimes with uh, executive leaders, uh, even for uh, CIOs and, and, and beyond, board members, whatever it is, you kind of have to tease out what they're really trying to get to. What, what, is, what are you trying to accomplish with that? Give me a goal and I'll meet it, but make sure the goal is measurable. Yep. Well, and I thought that that was a great answer and a comeback, too, saying, like, well, we're at 97% satisfaction. What number do you want? Right. And yeah. what will that look like? You know, that does – data really does make people stop and think. Yeah. Yeah. And you don't want to – you know, I, I'm, I'm praising data and maintenance, right? But you, mm -hmm. you don't want to be all about data. You don't want to be that uh, – the, the Star Trek – data guy right <laughs> he was my favorite character though data <laughs> you want to have a healthy balance you know because yeah. you want one of those uh, five essential skills i mentioned was relationship management so yes. you have to be able to manage a relationship too but you know so so for for leaders that can do both can say okay well give me more uh, around what you're trying to say but I'm going to actually give you some information so that you're better educated you know i've been told that uh, all it does is hand out laptops well, that's not true. We, we have a lot of uh, services that are provided that people don't realize are there. Part of being a leader is being an evangelist and letting people know all the things that you're doing. Yes. So when they come to the table to ask questions like that, they have an understanding of the depth and breadth of your of your organization yeah. and what, you're, what, what support you provide. And, you know, when that person says all you do is hand out laptops, I just turn off their, their ID card, you know, so they can't get in their office. And, then they, <laughs> and say... Just, I know you're kidding. I know you're kidding. But it's like, say, okay, come and see me, and then we'll talk about how I'm just handing out laptops. No, I think 
Yeah, that's not a problem with that person. That's a problem with me as the leader not articulating both our mission yep. and the 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 amount of ser- the, the services that we provide. So yes. that that was impetus for me to get to get that information out. Well, and I I agree with you very wholeheartedly that the CIO role is as much about being an evangelist. It's about using the influence of your C level position to make sure that everybody knows what your people are doing. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Now. And, and- and this reminds me of something we talked about you when you got your master's at the Center for Homeland Defense and Security. Um, well, before I ask the question, tell us about what that is. That's actually a state and local and federal government. You get you apply to uh, attend that program. Right. Explain what that is. It's a it's a great opportunity, and and it's something that uh, changed my life uh, in in a myriad of ways because I was you know. Um, uh, it was a different academic environment than I was used to. What what they do at the Center for Homeland Defense and Security at the Naval Postgraduate School is they uh, they take uh, state and local uh, and federal government officials and they put them through essentially what is a, uh, a course of study in uh, a master's in security studies. Mm-hmm. And that they bring some of the best minds in the country to bear on, on uh, a small group and uh, in and create a learning environment that's really, in my opinion, second to none that I've been in contact with. They have uh, a great deal of uh, expertise in running uh, a program that really changes the way people think and gets them outside of sort of maybe their paramilitary or depending on their background, mm-hmm. how they've come up through uh, uh, the different career paths that they are that they are on. And it kind of uh, gives them uh, a real academic experience that that creates a, a whole kind of a different uh, thinking person. Mm-hmm. And there's been a great deal of uh, folks that I'm sure some are your listeners that have been through it, but others in uh, in government as well as in uh, in the private sector now that are that are appreciating that. And you have to um, you have to agree to a certain amount of service in public in public service after you uh, mm-hmm. attend. And uh, it's well worth it. And, and if anybody, I, I recommend it to anybody that wants to be uh, security focused, but also have a appreciation for the world and all the different uh, nuances. Yeah. To see uh, things through it. As they, as they call them. Yeah. To see things through a leadership lens. To see Absolutely. all of this through that. And well, have some shorter programs too, uh, some executive leadership programs that are just as good if you don't need a master's, you can go uh, for you know a shorter amount of time. Mm-hmm. Well, and um, what I especially liked when you were telling me about that was your defining moment when you learned to think more like an artist and less like an engineer. Yeah, yeah. Well, I got picked on by one of the, uh, and the folks that have been to NPS will know who this is, but one of the <laughs> The main uh, uh, professors at uh, at uh, the Naval Postgraduate School Center for Homeland Defense and Security uh, sort of zeroed in on me as a as I think mm. and this was my perspective anyway as I think someone that thought in a linear sort of an engineering fashion that's my background mm-hmm. and they uh, and they kind of set out and I think for everybody in the class not just me but it affected me personally they set out to shake that up you know and to and to give you other perspectives. Yeah. And the way they did it was very artistic, and it's just uh, it's just really changed the way I approach problem solving. Okay, and you, because you said that you that engineers tend to think there's uh, there's a logic base, there's a way to fix this, there's a way to build something that will fix this, whereas artists right. are more likely to look at things in a more holistic fashion. Yeah, and and be more per, perhaps more willing to work with chaos. Ah, right, which has no so, rules, uh, as you pointed out. Yeah, sometimes uh, things devolve into chaos, and yeah. you know, I'm learning more about that all the time. But as you <laughs> as you approach uh, a chaotic situation, you kind of have to act as an artist. You have to try some and, and see how it goes, and then maybe pull back and, mm-hmm. and, and sort of. And, and engineers don't typically, you know, they they want to build the bridge and hold it up and you know how much weight is on it and all those things. Mm-hmm. But uh, sometimes you don't have all that information. Sometimes you have to sort of come with an artistic approach to problem solving. Yeah. And that's yeah. uh, that's what I learned there. And, and and I think a lot of the folks that go through that program learn that and they're better for it. And they're out there. Very fortunately, they've been uh, they've been in business. Uh, they've been doing this program for, I think, about 15 years. And these professionals are now out there in the public and private sector doing great work. So they're having a they're having a long term influence, which is essentially what you want to get to. 
Yeah, you talked about influence, and that's what that that's what this program does is it creates influence. You know, mm-hmm. it creates influencers. Yeah. yeah. Well, and uh, we've gotten another question here from our audience, which is really good in these final few moments when we're going to be talking uh, very much about leadership skills and developing them. And the question is based on your experience. What would be the three fundamental skills IT leaders should strengthen to be in line with the present? Woo. Isn't that a good a one? Great question. Whoever, <laughs> whoever sent that in, that's, that's an awesome question. Three <laughs> fundamental skills. I'm going to do a blog post on this because that's just such a great just a great title. And and it's the assumption here is that the IT leaders have these skills, fundamental skills they should strengthen to be in line with the present. Well, one one, one for sure for me is overcoming defensive routines. So uh, one of the things that I've experienced in working in IT is that the uh, IT folks are often, uh, not always, but often some of the smartest people in the room, right? These yes. are these are that are well-trained, well-educated, very knowledgeable, with a great deal of technical knowledge. And sometimes they're not um, as open to change as, as maybe some uh, uh, other folks, maybe the artist might be, right? Yeah, so cool. uh, as, you approach, uh, as you approach leadership in IT, one of the qualities that I think really makes a, a great IT leader is somebody that can uh, embrace change, understands the role of change in managing risk to an organization and also uh, helps the entire organization adapt so that they understand we're always going to be changing, folks. That's what I tell my people. Mm -hmm. Uh, Winston Churchill said, uh, to change is to improve. To be perfect is to change often. And so, you, you know, you got to think about, mm-hmm. and, and I probably just murdered that quote. I'm, That's okay. I, I think you got the sense of it across. <laughs> yeah, it, it's something like that. And, and honestly, the, the, uh, the, the uh, in fact, I put that when I took the job, I had a little binder and that was on the cover of the binder. Mm-hmm. So it was about being an evangelist for change. And, and once you get people across the finish line of change is one of our principles, mm-hmm. uh, you can help to help them to overcome some of the defensive routines. Another one is I think that all CIOs should have a security mindset. And I know that it's not, um, it's not always popular. And, and certainly I'm not the most popular person in the room. And I'm often not the most uh, empathetic person in the room when I bring up the fact that everybody needs to protect their data, right? Yeah. <laughs> that's where my mind goes because mm-hmm. that's what's going to keep our organization out of the newspapers out of the headlines and into uh, a place where we can uh, be comfortable with the fact that we have uh, our ducks in a row from Mm -hmm. a security standpoint. And then finally, a third one I would say is uh, probably that relationship management piece. Um, You know, don't be a siloed IT uh, organization. Mm -hmm. Reach out across the the boundaries. Uh, For us, probably the the biggest gap is between us and our academic um, uh, colleagues, Mm -hmm. right? So, with the business units, you know, finance, financial aid, HR, we're kind of in tight with them. They're using our systems. But when you reach out across the aisle and, and engage the academic, how does the academic perceive IT? Am I helping him or her do her job or am I causing their job to be more difficult? As Are their students happy? Uh, reaching across those aisles that you might nor- not normally be comfortable reaching across is essential. Yeah. Well, and I agree. And those were, you're absolutely, it's a good thing. This is going to be publicly available. You'll be able to wind this tape back and take notes on all the great stuff you just said. So for your blog post, it's perfect. You've essentially, yeah, yeah, you've kind of written it out loud. That was a great question. Yes, yeah. yes, it really was. Well, and we really are are wrapping up here. I uh, this has been um, a lot of terrific advice about leadership and change management. And you've been especially gracious to do this interview today when you are in the midst of it's not chaos because I'm sure you've got things pretty well organized, but you've yeah, got. You got a little bit of chaos. But there's no rules, right? Chaos has no rules. But it's a uh, it's a very stressful time for you and your staff. So I I wish you great luck. I'm sure the next time I hear from you, you'll have landed some somewhere else, and we'll be keeping in touch with us. Well, I will say that someone once said, I think it might have been Mark Twain. I might have that wrong, but someone once said, out of every great difficulty comes great opportunity. And uh, yes. honestly, I think this is a great opportunity, not only for me and my team, but also for uh, for other folks in the organization. We're going to 
we're going to look for those opportunities to improve personally and professionally. Mm -hmm. And uh, I appreciate your insightful questions and those of the, the audience today. Thank you. And uh, really, really, I'm thankful that you invited me on. I, I called you to make sure you wanted to still do it, even though uh, all the closure stuff was going and you were right back at me with mm -hmm. uh, absolutely. I think it was a great discussion, and I'm really appreciative. Yes. Well, that goes absolutely both ways, Jason. Thanks so much for doing this today. Thank you, Mary Fran. Okay. And if you joined us late, uh, you can watch this. Fear not. You can watch this full episode later, uh, a little later today. It will be posted on CIO.com, and it will be up on LinkedIn for a while as well. And we also post these interviews, the CIO Leadership Live series, to our YouTube channel, which is called IDG Tech Talk. And we recommend that you subscribe to that so you never have to miss an episode. And uh, we will be back again on Monday, March 2nd, uh, Streaming live once more. It'll be at noon Eastern, and I'll be joined by Ken Piddington, who is a VP and CIO of U.S. Silica down in Houston. So thank you so much for joining us today. Uh, thanks again to Jason, and thanks to our li live audience for all those fabulous questions. Every time yeah. I do one of these, my job gets easier and easier because of all those good questions. So take care and join us again for the next episode. Thank you. Bye.